Hey, good morning. Good morning, Dubuque. It's good to see everybody. I, I know people at that table. That's cool. Great. Hey, how are you doing? It's uh, always a pleasure uh, to be the MC for this event. I think this is a special event. Uh, it's good to see old friends as we come together. It's great to see some new faces. Uh, there's still folks coming through the food line. Uh, so you can keep eating. You really don't need to listen to me. Uh, I just want to introduce, thank you for being here. And by the way, I always forget to do this. I'm Tim Bees. I'm pastor at First Baptist, and I'm your MC for the day. Uh, this is Robin. Uh, she is our intrepid uh, signer, and she told me that uh, she might throw in boys are dumb or something like that. And I didn't even know that they had that in sign language. I learned that from our speaker. Can't believe you had such nasty. Anyway. So, hey, it's good to have everybody here. Um, let's see, I got a lot of thank yous. I want to start out this morning with the wait staff. You know, the Grand River Center is a great facility, and the wait staff is fantastic. And there goes one of them. And I don't know if anybody else is coming out. Uh, is anybody else going to come out? Can we just a round of applause for the wait staff for just what they do? Thank you. You represent, brother. <laughs> So our invocation this morning is by the UD Gospel Choir. Are you guys ready? Bridget Boone is the director, and it really is a cool group of folks who some are UD students, some are not. Um, and then the band is coming, yes. So they're going to be uh, do our invocation. They have two songs that they'll be playing. And then following them, Howard Lee will be coming up to give us a... Um, poetry slam called This Month Called February. March on till victory is won. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising south of our new day begun let us march on march on why don't you march march, march on to victory
let it resound loud roll and see the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on why don't you march come on march march on come on Good morning, everybody. I'm here today to take care of some serious business. I'm excited to be here and I'm thankful. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. This poem is called This One Month Called February. Whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere. Because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. Words spoken by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. See, when these words were delivered, it was at a time where water hoses were being sprayed on little boys and girls, parents and grandparents. Where canine units were being used not to sniff out a crime scene for drugs and other substances, but were indeed called to attack humans because Jim Crow said so. Where trees which covered the grassy front yards were bleeding of human blood from bodies being home. So now this is what we came to. See, we live in a generation where the mirrors we do look to don't have any reflections. And without a reflection, then there isn't any direction. And that's why we are dealing with attitudes of inconsistent patterns with people who have no testicular fortitude. So why does this seem to be a consistent problem? The problem lies within this political propaganda being presented on these biased news stations to strike fear into the hearts and minds of our people. And we see this action become reality when we get politicians telling us to vote against something or someone. But you're not going to put fear in me because fear in God don't occupy the same space. 
I do not make no pardon or no excuse me sentence for the words I'm about to say. Our ignorance on many topics such as race relations, civil rights, and politics are making us illegitimate children of this country. So what we don't know will hurt us and has hurt us because we are not equipped properly to fight this battle between this war where that thin line between blacks and whites lay. So now we found time to talk about Dr. King's dream or anything dealing with black prominence because a month on the calendar tells us to? So now with 28 days and sometimes 29 days, there's a sense of urgency to host events, spit poems, and raise awareness about people of African descent. Oh, I'm so glad that when I look at history, the civil rights movement or any movement that happened dealing with blacks, that it did not just take place in February, but all year long until missions got completed. Oh, I'm also grateful that there was a Freedom Summer that took place in the summer of 1964 and not just February. Or I'm also grateful for each movement that lasted 12 months out of the year and not just one. Or I'm very grateful that every person of African descent who made the difference in America and in the world were not just born in February. My point is this, and hear me clearly, do not degrade a movement that took many days and nights, blood, sweat, and tears, and minimize its worth by only bringing black prominence to light with this one month called February. The fact of the matter is, black prominence should be celebrated each day and, and moment because history does not lie. When I say the Nile Valley Africans gave us our modern day civilization, the Moorish people gave us the awareness of science and technology as they expanded their population to each continent, America was discovered and been discovered by people of African descent. And it is written in Christopher Columbus's diary on a map given to him from Africans. Now, let's turn our heads and spend each day in reflection to each direction that was taken from those who came before us. See, individually, we are each a movement, but no matter what the difference were between views and endeavors throughout history, Mega Evers, Stokely Carmichael, Dorothy Height, Bayer Rustin, Paul Robeson, Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, Nat Turner, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, Alexander Dumas, Fred Hampton, Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King, Dick Gregory, Richard Pryor, Huey P. Newton, Homer Plessy, James Farmar, Barack Obama, Fannie Lou Hammer, C.T. Vivian, June Jordan, Louis Farrakhan, Al Sharpton, Ida B. Wells, Roy Wilkins, Carter G. Woodson, Sojourner Truth, Antonio A. Negro, AKA Anthony Johnson, and thousands of others were activists who used their tools to activate the minds of us, to propel us where we are today. Peace. You'll notice in your program uh, that we have 11 black writers in 12 months. Kind of a challenge that, uh, again, let's get out of this February thing and let's explore uh, African-American thought uh, through African-American writers. So here's 11 writers that you can read a book a month. You got one month off, you know, because we know reading one book a month is difficult. Uh, but it gives you one month to consider some other options. Uh, think about what, what it happens. I, I know for me, uh, my favorite uh, theologian is James Cone, an African-American uh, liberationist theologian. Whenever I read him, it's hard for me to deny his experiences and his perspectives because I'm not thinking those things. So one of the reasons we created this list was just to help you uh, go somewhere else by reading uh, some thoughts from that are gonna challenge your thoughts because they're coming from a different place. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, take up that challenge if you'd like. Uh, we got a lot of people to be thankful for, for this event to occur. Uh, it says there, uh, so if you're an elected official, number one, we thank you for your service. We thank you for what you've done for us and we'd like to acknowledge your presence here this morning. Any elected officials in the room, we would ask you to please stand and so that you can be recognized. Please, please do that, don't be ashamed. Uh, you give us your service. Um, I neglected to mention, wasn't the Hempstead Jazz Band wonderful who gave us that music on the way in?
Nate Schatz was their leader this morning, so thank you, Nate, and thank you, band. That's wonderful for you to get up this early when you didn't have to, to be here. That's great. Um, if you, uh, we've never had this many reserved tables. I got to go down the list. We have tables reserved this year for the Multicultural Family Center, John Deere, Dubuque Community Schools, Clark University, Loris College, the Dream Center, Sisters of Charity, Black Men's Coalition, University of Dubuque, and the Eric Anderson family. I want to thank you for buying tables to support this event. We have over 300 folks here this morning, and that is a tribute to this city's commitment to seeing change happen. So thank you so much for, for that. Moving on. Yes, thank you. Uh, the uh, centerpieces on your table were created and crafted by young folks in our community who are attending either the Multicultural Family Center or the Dream Center. So there was creativity that went into those, artistic talent. Uh, we thank them for taking time out to do this. Uh, and while I'm on that line, let me ask some other things. I, we kind of thank tables. I'd like to have school administrators, school teachers from Holy Family, from Dubuque Public Schools, uh, college officials, college professors. Could you stand because I want to thank you for taking time out to again recognize the importance of this event and what it stands for. Could we just have you folks stand? Students, youth, if you're here this morning, could you guys just stand? Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, thank you. This uh, event is a collaboration that occurs through a lot of different groups. Uh, they're all on, they're, they're stated on the last page, but I will read them. The Dubuque Community School District does printing for us and a lot of other things. Um, the Dubuque Human Rights Commission, which by the way has a table out there if you missed it, uh, that has some really good information. They have always been a part of this Dr. King planning breakfast. Uh, First Baptist Church helps us out the Dubuque Area Congregations United creates scholarships every year for this event. John Deere Dubuque Works, we couldn't do it without you guys. The Dubuque branch of the NAACP, we thank you for that. Uh, the Community Foundation, can I just say, I, I was asking my wife, have we ever thanked them? The Community Foundation makes this thing happen. So thank you, all you folks who work with that group. We are so thankful for what they're doing in our community. One more thing, I'm hoping I'm not missing anything here. I'm, I'm checking all my notes. There is one individual that we wanted to just say thank you this morning. I've been involved with Faces and Voices that is the planning group for this for I think over 10 years now. And we've had folks cycle on and cycle off, but there's one person in Faces and Voices, you probably don't know her, but she's been the glue that holds us together. That's Marianne Conzet, and I'd like her to come forward because we just want to thank her. <laughs> On top of a busy schedule, you always make sure this thing's going to happen every year. So we just wanted to say thank you and just thank a little you. bit of a token. So Mary, thank you so much. Thank you. She's wonderful. So Manisha Padel is going to come. Did I pronounce that right? Okay, she's coming and she's going to introduce our speaker. So. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, let's try one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to introduce our speaker um, this morning. She is wonderful. Um, 
We met her, I actually met her yesterday. She arrived um, in Dubuque at 11 a.m. Um, and she got to the hotel, checked in by 12.15 maybe, and I was supposed to pick her up at 12.30. So she had 15 minutes really. And um, to go to the march. And we were running a little late. And she said, oh no, I'm kind of sad that we're gonna miss this march. I'm like, no, let's try to make it happen. We got to Jackson Park. Um, we were about a block away, and then we saw the march um, going. So we said, okay, let's follow them. Um, and we did. And we marched for maybe a block, but we made that happen. And that says a lot about a person, right? She could have easily said, well, yeah, let's, I actually offered to skip the march and go to the award ceremony, and she said no. So let's give her a round of applause for that. I don't know. I think it's respectful. <laughs> All right, and that wonderful lady is Margaret Wong. She is um, a longtime advocate. I'm going to read off of this because I can't remember everything. Um, advocate for human rights and racial justice. She is the deputy executive director for campaigns and programs of Amnesty International USA. And she's also the chief of staff. In that capacity, she directs Amnesty's programmatic work and serves as chief strategist for the organization's priority campaigns. A visionary leader, speaker, and writer, Wang has close to 20 years of experience in human rights advocacy and policy, overseeing national campaigns that have led to advancements of human rights legislation. 20 years. She previously served as the executive director of Rights Working Group, a membership coalition of more than 350 civil, civil liberties, immigrants' rights, and human rights organization that was founded in the aftermath of 9-11 to restore human rights protections eroded by national security policies. So last night when we had dinner, I asked Margaret to give me some of the quotes that she likes, some of Dr. King's quotes that she likes. She gave me two, so I'm going to read that. One, the first one is, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our, the, but the silence of our, yep, okay, let's try the next one. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Okay, so those two were her favorite quotes of the many that she has. Um, I obviously didn't offer to read five, but please help me welcome Margaret Wong. Good morning, everyone. I'm so impressed to see so many of you with so many smiles on your face at this time of day. Thank you all very much for being here. And I especially want to thank Faces and Voices for inviting me to join you this morning. It's a great privilege and something I've been looking forward to. I was once told that a really good speech is supposed to be like fashionable evening wear, dazzling, provocative, and shorter than expected. I'm going to try to deliver that today. In truth, it's a weighty responsibility to speak on Martin Luther King's birthday. But it's a great privilege to have the opportunity with all of you to think about where we are in 2015. How much have we accomplished Martin Luther King's dreams? In my role as the head of campaigns and programs for Amnesty International, I spend a lot of time thinking about the human rights challenges here in the United States. And I spend even more time trying to figure out how we make things better. So I'm excited to spend a little bit of time with you this morning to share some of those ideas and to invite you to be part of this work. Today, at the beginning of 2015, we're confronting a number of human rights violations in this country. Just this week, the headlines of newspapers across the country carried the story that more than one half of all of our public school students live in poverty. 
while this statistic is new, poverty in the United States is not. In 2013, more than 45 million people in the United States were poor, and 20% of children under the age of 18 live in poverty. The United States has less than 5% of the world's population, but we account for 25% of the world's prisoners, more than any other country. More than one in 100 adults today is behind bars in the United States. We spend nearly $50 billion per year operating prisons. Think how that money could be spent if we invested it in schools. There are 939 active hate groups in the United States today, a 56% increase since 2000. Might have something to do with the election of our first African-American president. The criminal justice system continues to have serious racial disparities in sentencing. Sentences imposed on black males in the federal system are nearly 20% longer than those imposed on white males convicted of similar crimes. These are especially stark disparities when you look at the imposition of life without parole for juvenile offenders. That's right. We're one of the few countries in the world that lock up children under the age of 18 for a crime they've committed for their entire lives. 77% of juvenile offenders serving this life without parole sentence in the United States are black and Latino. At the beginning of 2014, 42% of the defendants on death row were black, even though blacks only make up 13% of our population. But I don't need, and I certainly don't want, to spend my time this morning talking only about the problems that we face, significant though these are. I want to explore with you how do we tackle these problems? How do we move forward? And I thought maybe I'd start with my own path, how I became a social justice advocate. I grew up in a small town, not so different from Dubuque. Johnson City, Tennessee is a small town in the Appalachian Mountains, very pretty. It has a population of almost 50,000. They kept expanding the city borders so we could include a few more. And there's a large public university there. My story is also the story of my parents. My Chinese father and my white mother were an unusual couple in East Tennessee. My father started there as a graduate student. He won a scholarship to travel from Taiwan to study chemistry in the United States. When my father arrived in Johnson City, no one had ever met a Chinese man before. No one knew how to treat my father because he didn't fit into the town's racial construct. So my father was treated according to whom he was with. If he took a black lady out on a date, he was treated as black. If he took a white lady out on a date, he was treated as white. He had a very unique perspective on race for that time. He later moved to Illinois for his PhD and he met my mother. They decided almost immediately to get, a mar to get married. Of course, in many states in 1965, biracial marriage was still illegal, including Tennessee and my own home state now, Virginia. It wasn't until two years later in the Supreme Court case, Loving versus Virginia, that anti-miscegenation laws were declared unconstitutional and the 16 states that still had those laws on the books in 1967, not that long ago, could no longer enforce them. Growing up back in Tennessee, I attended a small school and I was one of only a few minority students in the entire school. My brother and I were also the only biracial kids that I knew. But honestly, no one, including us, ever thought of us as half white. We all understood that we were Chinese. I've often wondered how it made my blonde-haired, blue-eyed mother feel to have her children only self-identify as Asian American. But growing up in East Tennessee, I could never forget that I was Asian. I was constantly asked by both kind-hearted people and those less so, now where are you from, honey? If I tried to put them off by saying I was from Johnson City, they would say slightly more firmly, 
No, I mean, where are you really from? Growing up in a community my entire life, I was still always perceived as an outsider. I came to understand that I would never be accepted in my hometown. I think that my eagerness to explore the world had a lot to do with this realization. I was always seeking a place to call home, to be recognized as part of that community. As a human rights activist, I've also made a journey. I started my career focusing on women's rights in Asia, traveling around the world, working with incredible community leaders to promote and protect women's rights. But more than a decade ago, I experienced two life-changing events. The first is that I had my first child, and suddenly international travel wasn't all it was cracked up to be. The second is that I was pregnant on September 11th when the planes hit the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. And I started to see that human rights violations here at home, not, I started to see them for the first time, not because the problems hadn't existed before, but because I was not paying attention. I realized that we could not take our rights for granted and that we have to be vigilant to protect our human rights in our own backyard. So I decided to join the domestic human rights movement. For the last decade, I have worked to bring human rights home to the United States. And under the leadership of Amnesty's executive director, Stephen Hopkins, I'm proud to say that it's Amnesty USA's vision too. Together, we're working to demand police accountability in Ferguson, in Mexico City, and in Hong Kong. We're raising our voices in support of bloggers in Saudi Arabia, prisoners of conscience in China, and migrant workers in the United States. We're seeking to build a global movement for human rights, but one that starts here, at home. So what have we learned, given Amnesty's vision of bringing human rights home? And it's worth asking, how would Dr. King feel about civil rights today? Let's take stock of how far we've moved down the path toward achieving his dream of racial equality. The elections of 2008 were remarkable for putting in office our first African-American president. Just a few weeks ago, the Congress, which just took his seats, the 114th Congress, has almost one in five members that are racial and ethnic minorities. Of course, that's substantially less than their actual percentage of the country's population, which is almost 40%, but still, it's a new record. And across all sectors of society, education, law, business, entertainment, we see increasing diversity. But what about the issues, the civil rights concerns that inspired Martin Luther King to become a leader in the civil rights movement? Workers' rights, for example, the United States today lags behind nearly all countries in the world by not guaranteeing paid sick leave or annual leave, not guaranteeing paid parental leave, not giving paid time off to care for sick children, or even requiring one day of rest per week. Voting rights. After the Supreme Court ruled in June 2013 on a five to four vote, to overturn a key section of the Voting Rights Act, which Martin Luther King championed in 1965. Eight of the 15 states that were specified as problematic in the law passed or implemented voting restrictions in the following year, making it harder for low-income and minority voters to exercise their right to vote. How about policing? In Ferguson last summer, Protests erupted after the shooting of Michael Brown, an unarmed black teenager, by a white police officer. While the protests were sparked in Mike Brown's death, by Mike Brown's death, they caught fire across the country because of the high numbers of police shootings of many black men in many communities. And while there is little data collected at the federal level, An analysis of deadly police shootings from 2010 to 2012 shows that young black men, ages 15 to 19, 
are killed at a rate 21 times higher than their white counterparts by police. So for Martin Luther King, workers' rights, voting rights, the treatment of African American communities by the police were all at the heart of the civil rights struggle. If he were here today, he might not be celebrating our progress. But in reading the autobiography of Martin Luther King, I've been struck by a number of lessons that he drew from the activism and organizing of the 1950s and 60s, and these give me hope for our future. First, King emphasized the energy, the creativity, and the inspiration of youth in the civil rights movement. Student leadership in the 1960s started the sit-ins. The lunch counter sit-ins accomplished integration in hundreds of communities at the swiftest rate of change in the movement up to that time. In 1963, it was the organizing in high schools and colleges that helped to win the campaign in Birmingham. Even little children demanded to be part of the movement. King talked often about the experience of six small children who wanted to join the protests in Birmingham. So the organizers sent them to a library in the all-white section of town. And they marched in and sat down and started reading books and managed to desegregate the library. Ella Baker once said, until the killing of black men and black mother's sons becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until this happens. That was in 1964. For older generations, including mine, many of us have been surprised at the youth response in Ferguson. After all, the tragedy of police shootings of young black men has been around for a very long time. But we've also been inspired. The daily protests in Ferguson since August 9th the protests in more than 175 cities across the country after the grand jury in Ferguson declined to prosecute Officer Wilson. These actions have encouraged not only older activists like myself, but all activists to believe in the power of organizing. The spontaneity and the diversity of these protests has also been moving. Shutting down freeways, protesting in restaurants and malls, holding die-ins for four and a half minutes to represent the four and a half hours that Michael Ground lay on the street. These are actions that anyone can join, and many have. I was able to be in Ferguson in August and in November after the grand jury decision, and I can tell you that many of the people protesting were doing so for the first time. A second lesson that Martin Luther King has shown me is that he believed in the need and the fierce urgency of multiracial organizing. While there was a debate during the civil rights movement about whether or not to emphasize black power and whether we should engage white allies in the struggle, King came down very firmly on the side of engagement. And while I believe he was genuinely moved by the sacrifices of white allies such as Reverend James Beebe, Reeb and Viola Greg Liozola, in the movement, he was also a realist. When African Americans only constituted 10% of the population, it was clear that allies outside of black communities would be needed to win the fight. Today, our demographics are changing. In 2012, white babies became the minority among all babies born in the United States. In 2013, for the first time, racial and ethnic minorities made up half of Americans under age five. And in the fall of 2014, US public schools were projected to have more minority students than whites. Of course, in 2043, Whites are projected to be the minority population in the United States. Now that population is going to be more diverse with growing numbers of Latinos and Asians in the mix. But if we hope to build a more inclusive, equitable society, we have to have a strategy for multiracial organizing. A third lesson from Dr. King 
was that he understood the links of human rights across borders and across issues. King traveled to Ghana to celebrate its independence from Great Britain in 1957. He also traveled to India a few years later, where he keenly observed the treatment of the untouchables and the caste system there. He understood that the oppression felt in other countries was connected to the oppression felt here at home. And he urged his colleagues in the civil rights movement to learn from the experiences of movements around the world. Today, the human rights problems in our country are often, if not always, tied to human rights crises elsewhere. Last summer, we had a crisis of unaccompanied children crossing the southwest border from Mexico into the United States. This migration pattern has been spurred by the U.S. export of guns to Central America, where weapons are now an indispensable part of the drug trade and human trafficking. But the U.S. response to detain and incarcerate these children and the families who sometimes go with them, this does not un address the underlying crises, nor assist the individuals and families. The use of armed drones by US, the US military to take out national security targets in countries like Pakistan, Yemen, and Afghanistan has left the populations in those countries angry, afraid, and deeply resentful of US foreign policy. This is something that will haunt our future relations for generations. And the incredible reliance on fossil fuels that has fed this country's industrialization has also spurred global warming on a massive scale. Last year was the hottest on Earth since record keeper keeping began in the 1880s. And the 10 warmest years in history have all occurred since 1997, reflecting a planetary warming that poses profound risks to humankind and to all living things. This is going to affect access to water, production of food, and of course, all the cities that lie on the coasts that may someday be overrun. This is not a problem that we can solve here in the United States by ourselves. We have to join with movements around the world. So where do we need to go? If we learn from King's observations, we know that we have to engage youth, that we must all be part of the struggle, and that we need to link up with movements around the world. If we seek to achieve King's dream, if we want to achieve racial justice in our lifetime, then there's a lot of work to be done. The good news is that everyone can play an important role in this work. So here are some suggestions for you to think about. First, tell your story. When you know how it feels to sit in someone else's skin, to understand how they view the world and why, you'll often find that you have something in common and something to admire about that person. Try reading the books that the Reverend mentioned that are in the list of your program. Ask yourself if they give you a different perspective on life. Consider having interesting conversations about race with people who are not your own. Is it comfortable? Not usually. Is it enlightening? Almost always. So if you, sitting in this audience, are willing to tell your story Wave your hand. Look around. And if you're thinking about starting conversations about race, you've just found some willing partners. Second suggestion, get active in your community. Faces and Voices is a great start here in Dubuque, as are the many other organizations who helped put together this morning's breakfast. Join a group. Participate in activities. Become a leader. You can even join Amnesty International. The more engaged that you are on issues, the more that you can do to educate others and to affect more change. If you're active in a community group here in Dubuque, please stand up. 
Excellent. For those of you who aren't standing, please take a moment to notice everyone who was. Seek them out. Ask how you can get involved. A third suggestion, get out the vote. King believed in the power of the right to vote. <laughs> you can clap for that. <laughs> <clears throat> and he believed that civil rights could only be accomplished if we registered voters who care about these issues. So please help. Sign up to register voters. Drive voters to the polls on election day. Support candidates who believe in a racially just society. Don't give up on politics. Politics just produces the leaders that we deserve. Don't settle for less. If you're going to help with the elections in 2016, please clap your hands. If you aren't registered to vote, but you'll commit to registering by 2016, clap your hands. Good. Good for you. <laughs> If you're too young to vote, clap your hands if you'll ask your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your grandparents to vote, and you'll remind them to do it on election day. Thank you. <laughs> remind everyone why it's important. A fourth suggestion, stand up for justice. We all see injustices in our day-to-day -day lives. At school, a student may see someone who's being bullied. At work, an employee may see a colleague who's being harassed. You might encounter a racist or sexist remark at the store or at the park. Don't let those violations stand. Organize in your school and in your workplace and demand that we protect those who are victims. Join with others to denounce hate. Speak out for those who may not have a voice or whose voice has been silenced. Join with others to do it, because as King said, in all of our actions, we must stick together. Unity is the great need of the hour. And if we are united, we can get many of the things that we not only desire, but which we justly deserve. If you're willing to stand up for justice, Please stand up now. That's beautiful. <laughs> if you will speak out against hate, intolerance, and injustice, keep standing. Please look around the room. These are your allies. You can join with them to make Dubuque a better town, a great town. Thank you, you may sit down. <laughs> I know that Manisha quoted this earlier, but I'm gonna share it again, because it is my favorite. Dr. King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience, but where he stands in moments of challenge, moments of great crisis and controversy. I invite you to join me and all of your fellow residents here in Dubuque in accepting the challenge, in welcoming the crisis and the controversy. I hope we'll work together to create a future that respects the rights of all human beings. Thank you for listening. I'd like to invite uh, Pastor of the Dream Center up right now, J.J. Kimball, to give us our benediction.
All right. Good morning. Um, for some reason, they didn't have anyone else, so they called me uh, to uh, give some give some sort of prayer. Uh, so I am going to um, ask you all to join me um, in a moment of prayer. Um, this is um, a, a blessed, blessed um, opportunity for all of us to remember uh, one of my heroes and one of the reasons why um, I and many others were motivated to um, start the Dream Center which um, is mission driven to carry out and continue many of the issues that Dr. King died for and many others uh, like him. And so if you would just um, take a moment to bow your head and pray with me. We are grateful for the gift of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all those who sacrificed for justice during the civil rights era, who spoke to the conscience of a country that pledges one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, he refused to believe the American Bank of Justice was bankrupt. And since the civil rights era, we have cashed in on the prosperity of progress towards unity and equality for all children and families to access the American dream. But many of us recognize that the cause for justice is still relevant today in our country and also right here in our own community in Dubu of Dubuque. My prayer and my hope and my continued contribution is that God will guide and drive us to action towards one community under God that is inclusive and welcoming for all. May the Lord bless you and keep you this day. And may you be challenged and encouraged to continue on what Dr. King committed his life to, not only today, but for the rest of many of your lives, as long as there is a cause for justice. In Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Thank you, church folks. That's the end of our program this morning. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next year. Blessings.